Yeah. Thank you, Rosa. Um, great pleasure to have you all here. Um, thank you for coming this evening. Um, all right, I'll start with a brief introduction of who I am. Uh, my name is Ajay Reddy. Um, I'm based in Bangalore, India. Um, I started something called Go UNESCO, but before that, that's my um, brief history. I've been um, a corporate employee, then I've had a couple of startups, but I show this to emphasize a couple of things. One, I do not have a background in heritage. Um, two, the things we have done um, sort of learn from all these experiences that I've had in my previous work, and uh, that is the important reason why I show that slide. Um, of course, an outsider's view probably is going to be different from a heritage professional's view of how heritage should be um, brought to more people, uh, but that's again a debatable, um, there's a different discussion we could have about that. Um, Go UNESCO, we started in 2012, um, it's about three plus years now, three and a half years. Um, it is a UNESCO supported um, initiative now, they are, we are kind, kind of partner uh, partners with them. Um, it's just three things that we have in Go UNESCO. There are online travel challenges, um, there is a student program and there are something called Go Heritage Runs that we have started organizing recently. Um, I'll just take you through what that is and then probably tell, talk about the simple concepts which I think have worked in making heritage a little bit more fun. Um, then the question why exactly, we'll, pr we'll try to go over that. Uh, what is Go UNESCO? It is challenges. So we started with a simple idea. Um, it was a personal challenge for myself. I, I thought to myself that I want to travel to all world heritage sites in India in 2012. And that was Go UNESCO to start with. Um, it grew larger, it grew bigger from there through friends and their friends and then the media picked it up and then uh, more people joined but it's basically a travel challenge to begin with. Uh, so we have country challenges where you're traveling to world aided sites in India, there's another challenge in Germany, there's one challenge in uh, South Africa now in the US also. Uh, but then we expanded the idea of the challenge to include all world heritage sites across the world. That's uh, practically impossible. Maybe somebody will ever, will possibly do it, but uh, not an easy thing to do. There are people trying to do it. Uh, so the, p the person who has traveled to the most number of world heritage sites now is on the challenge is about 290 odd, um, which is not a small number. Um, we also have a new challenge which UNESCO suggested, that's the yellow uh, logo which you see there, that's the culture challenge. Um, UNESCO also has a repre representative list of intangible cultural heritage elements which could be uh, experienced across the world. There are about 360 of uh, 316 to be exact, that's the number. Uh, but these are lifetime challenges. There is no practical way of putting a time limit on it. Uh, so we said, okay, in the course of your lifetime, if you are able to visit all these world heritage sites or experience all these cultural elements, you win. Uh, we don't know what prize we will give them, but uh, the idea is for the annual challenges, which are the country challenges, uh, there is a specific prize at the end of the year, which uh, based on how many number of uh, world heritage sites in that country you travel to. So that was the beginning, uh, but we also started a student program in 2014 uh, where we try to make heritage a little more fun to younger folks. And uh, our primary audience is college students in undergrad and postgrad courses. These could be from any stream. They could be engineering students, they could be law students, they could be arts or humanities students, anybody uh, at all can join. Uh, this is a six months program, January to June, January through June and July through December. And then um, there are specific tasks given to these tasks, uh, to the students, for example, uh, go get a photograph taken at a world, or at any heritage site in your city um, or something like that. So the idea is to engage them in heritage without preaching to them or asking them to learn about it by themselves. So through the task, they try to experience or understand about heritage but hopefully we are making some uh, progress in making the tasks a little more fun so that they want to do it and they, we don't have to tell them to do it. Uh, we'll talk about those tasks in a uh, short while. Uh, the third one, um, which, is a, which is the most recent uh, initiative we started um, called Go Heritage Runs. The idea is, um, I have, I'm a long distance runner for a few years and um, India has seen a tremendous growth in um, 
running as a sport which has been which is almost mainstream now it was a very niche sport earlier uh, now we have multiple city marathons there are um, events every weekend almost in major cities and I have personally seen my friends travel abroad to Athens to Boston to New York to uh, Phnom Penh to, to Cambodia to run marathons and they make it a vacation along with a run because they are going that, that far anyway and I thought okay why not combine this um, idea of running or having a vacation along with a run and try to encourage tourism inside India itself. So what we are trying to do is organize runs at heritage sites, different heritage sites in India. It could be a world heritage site, it could be a, a lesser known heritage site too. Uh, we try to combine it with a cultural experience. I have some material from the runs which I can show you later on, but we also um, are trying to say that these are fun runs. These are not timed events where you have to or you are trying to aim for a very good timing and finish as quickly as possible. That's not the aim. The run is an idea to attract people to that location and have a cultural experience. So on the previous day, we try to get some um, something or the other, which is probably not possible to do if you were traveling alone. So in one location, we organized a field trip with a researcher who had discovered a ancient aqueduct system in that location. In another, we had a, a a traditional dance for performance which was a war dance used by a Kakatiya Empire which is a very old uh, um, dynasty which used to rule in that region. In Uti where we are going to have a run at the end of this month we are going to organize a tea tour because that region is famous for its tea plantations. Um, so these kind of things combined with a run make it a very good offering for anybody to go because now because we have a few hundred people coming to the run uh, we are able to organize it at scale which we couldn't or one couldn't get if they were going in a small group. Um, so that's Go UNESCO. Those were three things. Um, the travel challenges, the student program, and the Go Heritage Runs. These are the three initiatives we have. Of course, I have a lot of ideas and plans on how we can do more things, but um, based on bandwidth, we will or we will not do them. Uh, but the idea is, um, has always, of course, we started with just the travel challenges. And there we said, will make discovering world heritage a little more fun. But as I saw, uh, as I, I mean, as we grew or as we went ahead with Go UNESCO, we noticed that it is not world heritage sites alone that require attention. It is heritage in general. And that's when we said, okay, let's try to become a little more expansive in our goal, try to make heritage itself fun. And um, that goes, well, I'll explain why I try to put that as the, uh, overall vision of what we are doing a little later uh, but some concepts I think have worked for us maybe uh, that is something I will try to share uh, okay that was so how do you make heritage fun I'll explain or I'll talk about some of the things that I think we have been able to achieve uh, the first thing is stories so um, it's a very simple idea you want a story in your life or with your vacation or with whatever you do if you have a story you will remember it you will probably talk about it and uh, what is the story that we are trying to uh, help people get out of whatever they're doing uh, it's the story of travel it's the story of traveling or having a year where you travel to all these world heritage sites i will talk about the travel challenges themselves because they are very short duration it's just for a year that you're traveling and i'll talk about these three uh, people well, three, three people are uh, okay to explain who these people are they have uh, they, these ladies and uh, one gent are the winners of the Go UNESCO India challenges um, from 2012 13 and 14 the lady on the left most uh, her name is Jai Bharti she was the first winner she went to 28 world edit sites in one calendar year and she started in April by the way so um, a very rapid succession of visiting uh, world edit sites uh, the second picture is of a couple, um, Parul and Ajay. They started traveling on the tra challenge and I believe they visited about 22-23 in 2013. And Sangamitra Jayant, uh, she traveled in 2014 and she went to 26 World Heritage Sites. So the first lady is unique because at that time we had only 28 World Heritage Sites in India and she visited all of them, which I never thought would be possible. Um, so originally, like, like I said, I started it myself. I thought I'll travel. I did not, she did. Uh, but the point is, uh, now these people, why did they travel? 
uh, or what is it that they got out of traveling because I never promised any prize there was no real reward of winning a challenge they just went because they wanted that story for that year and that story is going to stay with them forever and that story is the, th is the key theme of the Goenesco Travel Challenge it is a story you can carry forward with you and it's like a, a, a bookmark in your life when you did something really interesting or really unique so stories are something we try to give with every activity we do and these travel challenges are a perfect example for people to take back or to create a story by themselves now we do not define how you travel or how you should travel or who you travel with or when you should travel all we said is go to travel go travel to world heritage sites and tell us by posting your picture on the website and that that was about it now through this year of travel they have they have changed themselves uh, for example, Jai Bharti, I traveled with her when she went to the first World Heritage Site. She was traveling. She was just really, um, she, was in a she was a corporate employee. I wasn't, I was starting up, so I, I didn't have a lot of money. But um, she said, let's hire a cab, an AC cab, all the way from Hyderabad to the World Heritage Site closest by. That was about 300 kilometers away. And I was shocked because um, that was going to be a lot of money. And then go, let's, let's go stay at an AC hotel. Um, that was her first trip. But by the end of it, she was a full-time backpacker who wouldn't care about what kind of hotel she was staying at. She would probably not even stay at a hotel. She would just travel overnight in a train and then visit the site and then go traveling again overnight to save money. So now that was a transformation that she had in that one year. And it didn't end with that one year of travel. She actually went to travel to Turkey and covered all the World Heritage sites there in 15 days the next year. So now the challenge has given her a story and an interesting turning point because it has changed how she approaches travel itself and why she travels. Because earlier, she, of course, she has been traveling all her life maybe, but she wasn't really thinking about World Heritage Sites. But it is fun to do it as a challenge. And that's the story they have for themselves. Uh, Sangamitra, for example, she was speaking yesterday and uh, she, of course, has had the travel itch for a very long time. But now, because of her travel, her kids are learning about heritage when they go with her on the, tr the trips. And the kids have formed a travel club in their community where they talk, talk to other kids and tell how their uh, travels have been or they talk about destinations and talk about why they should go there. So the stories are what uh, people remember for a longer time. And that is what every activity should probably try to give anybody who's, involving, uh, who's getting involved in them. The other thing is photographs or pictures. We all love Instagram, we all love Facebook, and we have to think of why they are so successful or why, what is it about them that uh, makes them so addictive. It's photographs. Um, of course, we know the old adage that uh, a photograph speaks a thousand words, uh, but it's much more than that. You can see a lot more than just the destination. For example, any of these photographs, it tells a story by itself there's a person having fun at that destination it is not just boring history or dates that are important it's a lot more than that you can have an experience you can actually get some great looking photographs to um, satisfy your narcissistic tendency tendencies too uh, but the point is photographs are effective in getting a person to be inspired and that's why we look at photographs all the time and that's why facebook changed its layout changed its layout multiple times and has continuously made photographs a lot more um, visible and a lot more uh, impactful. Even today, the algorithm is pretty clear. If you keep noticing, you will not see as many status posts or status updates as you would see a photo photograph update. It is always, it's quite clear. If you uh, just carefully look at how or what appears in your feed, you'll be pretty, uh, you can make it out. Uh, but photographs have been effective and that is what we use. So we said, uh, with GoInusco, all you have to do is share a photograph on the website of your travel. That is all you need to do. The rest is all optional, but the photograph is absolutely important. And that photograph, when it shows up on social media, it attracts 10 more people to think about what this was about. And that's uh, uh, one more thing we thought has made Heritage a little more uh, engaging for people because it is not about just of the history, but it is about an experience that these people are showing through their photographs. The other thing were what we did or tried to do 
was change the language used. Since I'm an outsider, I do not know the jargon, I do not know the uh, formal terms of uh, uh, defining or talking about heritage. Um, there's one particular phrase which I keep hearing a lot, capacity building, which I cannot understand even now. Um, I keep asking Jimmy about that, but um, he says it is a UNESCO specific word, but anyway, um, I do not get that. So we have tried to stay with the times and um, particularly this slide is particularly about the student ambassador program uh, where we said we gave tasks to students. So now these younger people are not going to listen to me if I'm going to say let's go uh, talk about heritage in a particularly technical way and they are not heritage professionals or, or technical people themselves. What they understand is what is popular in their language so the language they speak is quite different from mine I, as well uh, so we try to be reflecting their language instead of just imposing our own uh, so for example go UNESCO selfie now it's a very simple uh, phrase or a, a set of words uh, it's very apparent what is a selfie we all know a selfie uh, the idea was uh, this was a task and we give a hashtag to every task because that's clearly understandable hashtag is the word um, uh, is the most common way of uh, getting ideas across these days apparently. Um, so Go UNESCO Selfie was a task where people or our students had to go take a selfie at a heritage destination in their uh, city. So now um, of course it is a very simple task, go get a photo taken but through that task they have to understand what are the heritage locations in their city. Now they have to go find out how to get there, they have to go there, they have to experience that heritage and come back and write about it. So now it's a simple task which in two words can be explained but there are a few processes through which they learn about heritage. So we are not making it very difficult to understand what they have to do but we are trying to make it a little more relatable to them. Uh, similarly heritage nominate wanted or uh, we asked the students to go take five of their friends to this place where they went earlier for their selfie and get a photo taken but now they have influenced five more people to go and experience that heritage destination. Um, similarly, um, my UNESCO trip was, uh, the students had to actually create a hypothetical 15 day travel plan to five different World Heritage sites near their city, starting from their city. Uh, but the language I think has uh, really worked in, our, in this case for students who uh, can relate to what we are talking about uh, without making it too heavy for them. So the language also mattered. The other thing uh, we have very uh, keenly worked on is gamification. Uh, if you remember the first slide, um, my background, I worked at a mobile startup where we were gamifying um, travel and local search. And gamification is a very simple idea. It's a reward system. What is, what is a game? A game is where you perform a set of actions and you get a particular reward at the end of it. So now um, I show a couple of things on this slide. There is a leaderboard. This is a leaderboard for the India Challenge in 2014. So everybody has points here. So these points are based on how many tra World Heritage Sites you go travel to in that year and uh, how many information um, tidbits you add to your travel, whatever proof you added. So we try to encourage people. Initially, of course, we started with just photographs being posted on the website. But now we also ask people to add some more informa information which can be helpful to other travelers. For example, when did you go? Where did you stay? Where did you eat? Uh, what is the one thing you would not miss again if you went there? So these things are given extra points and at the end of it you have a leaderboard where you are saying um, I'm at the top of the leaderboard or I'm second in the list or so on. Uh, we use leaderboards everywhere. Even the student program uses leaderboards. Um, so there are specific points allocated when you complete a task. At the end of the six month period you have to have at least 50% points of the total available. So if we had 10 tasks, we had uh, 1000 points, you have to have at least 500 points in order to get the certificate as a student. Um, so leaderboards have been a great way to encourage people to actually do things that we want them to. Uh, similarly, uh, the passport that you see on the right um, these are run passports. So we, like I said about the Go Heritage Runs, so we are organizing a series of events at different locations. And we said there is a similar idea of what we are doing at each of these locations. It's a very consistent experience, hopefully. Uh, but we want people to keep coming back. And we want 
the same people to experience heritage in different locations. For example, India is a vast country. There is heritage of various kinds. Every region has its own culture. Every region has its own arts and crafts and so on. Uh, but the idea is, if you want people to keep coming back, they have to be rewarded for loyalty. So what is the point, what is the way to do, encourage that? Uh, this is a fun way to remember that you have been to all these different uh, places or the runs. And at the end of every run, once you finish your run, you get this stamp to put on your passport. And if you have three stamps, the fourth run is free for you. So it's a simple way, but it's also a very good memory to keep and carry on. So I have a couple of passports. I can show it to you a little later. Um, but the, the idea is gamification makes it a little more enjoyable to do whatever activity you're doing. And gamification is there, is seen everywhere. We don't realize it but there is gamification in almost every sphere of our life. So uh, college is a great example. You have to get your assignments in, you get your grades, and that is a clear demarcation of what you are able to achieve. And it is also a motivation for you to achieve what the university wants you to, which is education. Get your um, skills right, go get educated. But it's a very good system uh, to motivate people to do things. Um, of course, credit cards are another, are another example. Airline points are another example. They want you to keep coming back. They want you to uh, scale these levels and then go on and progress into becoming an expert. The expert level is the best, obviously. Uh, but there is a lot of literature about gamification also and how even ordinary things can be made a lot more engaging if you have gamified systems. Uh, but that has also helped us. The other thing is uh, we use technology to a very large extent. Uh, we are online constantly. Our, we started with online systems. Now we are, of course, a little offline as well with the runs. Uh, but there is plenty of things we do uh, socially to, to, of course, get scale. Um, I worked alone for about uh, three years on GoNSCO. I've been doing everything by myself. Now I have another person to help me out. Uh, but if I did not if I could not use technology properly, I would not be able to get so many people doing all these things. So we have about uh, 2,000 odd people traveling around the world on the challenges. We have about three, 400 people coming to the runs every, um, every, every month or every two months whenever we have a run. Uh, we have had three, well, two runs this year already and we have five more planned. Um, we have about six, 500 students from about 45 countries participating. So, so the online social media channels that we use have been a very large, uh, to a very large extent, uh, been a very good uh, way for us to grow and to achieve scale. Uh, and being a per, being a single single uh, what do you call person who is doing everything, you can't do everything. I mean, even posting on a Facebook page takes time, and posting posting anything on Twitter takes time. So, how do you make it work so that you do one thing and it gets replicated to three or four places. So if it is a wonderful software, the one in the middle, um, it gets you to, I mean, you can define actions based on uh, whatever tasks you do. For example, I put up a post on the website, it goes directly to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram maybe. So those things have been able to, have been able to, have we have been able to do a lot of things at a bigger scale because of these tools that we use. Then, of course, uh, lowering barriers. So what, like I said, uh, the challenges themselves are a great way of lowering barriers. So we do not put in too many rules. For example, if you are traveling, the only goal is to travel to World Heritage Sites. How you do it, when you do it, who you do it with is not what we are going to define. All we want you to do is go travel. And that itself reduces some of the uh, heavy or uh, perceived difficulty in doing um, or learning about heritage. Of course, we can debate about is this a good way to do, uh, what do you call, get people to understand about heritage. Maybe, maybe not, but the point is at least they're getting aware of heritage. And uh, lowering such barriers like making it a little easy to do whatever we want them to do um, has helped us in getting uh, the message across. So although they may not uh, start getting a very deep insight into heritage, at least they are starting with it. People who never thought they would visit a heritage site, for example, I also did not uh, want to travel to world heritage sites or he any heritage sites, honestly. Uh, but I started because I thought I put it up as a challenge to myself and that made it a, a, a little easier and a little more fun. 
So why exactly we do all these things? Of course, we I said herit, make heritage fun. Why? Why? What is the point anyway? So I have a very personal um, reason, and uh, this is the reason why I started all this. This is a photograph of a ticket at a World Heritage site in India, and that's the tweet which I saw, which gave me the idea to travel to all these World Heritage sites, because I did not do, know them myself, and I thought it was a pathetic uh, way uh, I could. I mean, I could not live with myself that there are these World Heritage Sites which are recognized across the world and I don't even know them. And these are in India where I have traveled quite a bit and I thought I was a pretty good traveler. And it changed that notion because of this one photograph. So this was a very personal reason why I started GoUNESCO and why I want more people to uh, learn about heritage and World Heritage. So that was one of the, uh, that was the key things which started. And of course I want heritage to be, I mean, my perception has changed over time. I started with that, but then when I started working in heritage and interacting with a lot of people, I thought there is a, I mean, there is a gap in what should be or what and how it should be. So in India, at least, uh, what we do, or forget about India, I think across the world, there is a big, um, what do you call, um, the, the most common thing that you hear when you hear heritage is how it is lost. The first thing is, oh, ISIS has destroyed that and there's some other f structure falling down. And this is the most common, what do you call, news that you listen to. And I do not believe that this is the only news that we should be listening to. There should be more to heritage. And there is a perceived uh, notion that governments own heritage, which I do not agree with. I think people own heritage and it, people should be motivated into doing a lot more for heritage than expecting the government to do anything at all. Of course the government has to support it because it has finally got the means and the uh, ability to do a lot more. But I believe that people if they were really interested or they were really keen, they were made to be keen or motivated to do things, they could achieve a lot more and ask the government to do a lot more. Because people don't care. I think heritage is lost or heritage is not cared for enough. And there are great examples of people actually doing things. But these things do not come out. And through GoUNESCO or through making heritage fun, this is what I really want people to feel, that it is our heritage and heritage is something I should also work towards and not expect just uh, governments to help out and so on. But that's uh, basically it. Uh, Heritage can be made fun through some concepts that I talked about. There are a lot more ways, of course, uh, but that was briefly what GoNSCO has been trying to do and hopefully will keep doing. If you have any questions or anything. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.